so today I'm going to talk about an ambition, and it's an ambition that kind of like is one of humanity, and it's um, it's of the hologram. We kind of had this dream for a very long time, like since the since the 80s, since the 70s, of um, of a completely uh, manipulable visual space where you could have a room and things could appear in it and they could digitally appear and disappear, entirely manipulable, entirely digital, and coexisting with us. And um, it's kind of, this is what a, a real life hologram is like. It's a, it's a piece of glass which can um, replay everything that happened behind it as if the thing, object was still there. But it's not the same kind of thing that we're after. And we end up making things like this, this kind of like, um, we call it either a fake hologram or a, or a pretend hologram. And it's, it's to try and live out this, this science fiction fantasy in a way which kind of is, is, is accessible. Um, but I'm kind of curious, like, how far we could get with this idea of, like, trying to make manipulable digital forms exist in the same space as us that we can really feel and really, really feel like we, we share space with. So I'm just going to hop over a little bit. Does anyone know what Pandir is? Some people. Um, I started that um, <laughs> at the Students' Union. And it was a platform for people to, to make... Um, well, there's always, there's always these loads of discussions in universities, right? There's like there's people like in the bar, at home, or whatever, and they've got these crazy ideas. And they've got like loads of passion and loads of talent, and they're looking for a way to platform that. They're looking for someone to fund it or to commission it. And they don't really know what all those things mean. They just know they want to make it. Um, and this was kind of a... Um, uh, an institution which tried to bring together a lot of those different kind of people. So there'd be like 20 different rooms and want to be theater and want to be visual arts or whatever. And I used it as a platform to try and experiment with this idea of trying to make um, digital 3D forms. And I did it with some of the people who are in this room. So this is what we made. We made this kind of box. And within this box, there's, there's loads of lines. And along each line, there's loads of pixels. And it means that like all these pixels are distributed in 3D space and we can try and create a form in, in the same room as you. It's a really bad video, and the number one lesson from this is when you make something, document it really well. <laughs> um, but you could feel the mass of it, and this was, this was really compelling. When you're near to it, you could feel it coming towards you. You could feel like something in the room is, is changing. You could feel kilograms happening in front of you, and it's all just projection. So we tried to, um, we tried to see where we could go with this. Um, and like coming out of university at the time, the it was 2007, and, and what, what everyone was telling you was, if you want to make something out of something, you better make a business out of it. So we tried that, and uh, the university gave us a, a grant. We, um, we won a competition, and we filed patents, and we thought, oh, great, we're going to make this business, and we're going we're gonna to make the most, uh, we're going to take this so far. We've got so many ideas about how the resolution's going to improve and how we're going to sell it to all these people, and the, our, our ambition to, to create the world's best kind of 3D experience Will be will will couple greatly with um, the idea of making money. Well, um, that didn't work out. <laughs> so <laughs> obviously, this is like commercial suicide. If you want to make if you want to make something, then you can't make a business out of it because businesses are there to make money. And if you're not there to make money, then you have to go home. You have to try and always throw away the thing that you're passionate about, really, to make to make to make uh, to make a startup. So instead, we all went our separate ways, and I started this art and design studio called Kimchi and Chips. And we think about like making technologies, um, making them always open source, and trying to trying to do design experiments. And sometimes that gets portrayed as an art project, or sometimes it goes into into maybe a product. And I made it with Mimi San, who's the other one from Kimchi and Chips, where the uh, Korean flavor comes from. Um, so she's she's an interaction designer, and I learned a lot from her about how to translate what was coming from um, kind of a physics background, making something that's purely technical and trying to make it into something that was a bit more um, emotional or, or relating to people. So we made a few projects which, which kind of, um, which used some of this technology that we were developing with Lightscape to try and make things which related to people. So we, we started off by making these memory boxes. Um, and there's like this little box and you could arrange slides in it. And it was very, it was very personal. You could, um, you, could, you could give it to somebody. It wasn't like a lab experiment and, and this, this allowed us to start thinking about what, where we wanted to go with this, with this other technologies that we had. What, what is it we could do with them? How could we get people to play with them? So this was called Journey. And the next project I'm going to show is called Link. And this, again, is about storing memories in boxes. And um, with this one, it was, uh, it was for a, an exhibition called Design Career, where there's a load of people exhibiting stuff, and there's a load of people visiting. 
But there wasn't a lot of cross-pollination between the two. It was always like, someone talks about something, someone advertises it, gives you a brochure, and you say thanks and say goodbye. And we wanted to try and flip it over so the audience was going to become part of the, um, the dialogue much more. So th we, this was right at the entrance, and people would come in and they'd record themselves and they'd instantly be part of the installation. And this kind of flipped around a bit of the role of the audience as they enter. Um, and this was all made during op using open source software, which we released on the internet. And then uh, last year, we made this project, which was a kind of continuation, again, of the, the more private box, where, um, and it kind of crosses over a bit with Lightscape. There's like a little box, and it's got all these details, really small line details, and they get projected onto exactly in a way which composes a scene. Um, but this time, you can just draw whatever you want, and it automatically scans it. And then based on the scan, the, the, the projection can react to it in order to um, create a, a kind of visual experience. So um, what we thought with this was um, we can take what we had with Lightscape of trying to create these 3D forms in space, and instead of like um, contriving a very, um, a very mechanical box that we, could, that we could project onto, we can maybe look to something in reality which already had these properties. It already was sparse, it already occupies space, had loads of elements inside of it, and use the scanning technology to find out where all the pixels were going. So we looked at something like this. It kind of looks like a Lightscape, what we were doing before. But it's, um, it already exists, and it already has a lot of connotation about what this object's for. And the idea is that if you can, um, if you can project into this tree, you can imagine like you have a, you have a cloud of, um, of, of leaves and branches here, and your projector's going into it, and then each pixel is going to land on an individual little bit of this tree. And then if you, if you can start constructing images out of the collection of these pixels, and you can make a shape on the tree, and if you do it, that in a way that's sensitive to the shape of the tree, then you can start like having a collaborative animation with it. You can start thinking about, we want to make an animation which is defined this way, and it follows the shape of the tree. And we do it using this method called structured light, which um, if, you, if you took a video of me now, you'd be able to get a 3D scan. It, you look at the way the, the patterns are distorted on me, and you, can fi you could figure out using a computer what my 3D shape is. So we use this, we use this method, and, we made lots of open source tools again. And um, this is what the project looks like. I had to turn the audio off for copyright reasons. <laughs> <laughs> um, so with this one, uh, again, it's like there's a, there's a tree there, and it's, um, there's a, a few projectors firing into it. And we're kind of scanning it to find out where all these pixels are landing. And we've got this interaction mode where if you put your hand in, you can, um, you can select a section of the tree to light up. And that means you're kind of mirroring your 3D form of your hand in the tree, so you can see it in 3D space. But also, you're having this relationship with the tree, because the thing that the tree responds to most um, immediately is light, right? If you, if, you, if you have light on a tree, it affects the way it grows. Not least so because you put it in a dark gallery, and it's got no other light to respond to. <laughs> but, um, so it automatically is, responds in shape to the way you project to it. So if you reach your hand into it, somehow you're kind of feeding sections of it. You're promoting growth in different sections, and you're selecting the way in which the tree grows. You're having some kind of communication with it. And in return, it's affecting the graphics. All the graphics are generated in response to its form. So there's a two-way relationship there. So it also it, it does all these like, amazing technical things. It automatically um, moves out of shadow so if you've got a projector over here and the leaves in shadow, then it's going to move that leaf out for you so it catches the light from the projector. It's doing all these things that are like super neat, which you, you'd want to do with a mathematical algorithm, but it kind of naturally has them itself. Um, but then we fell into this problem, um, which was that we were creating these 3D forms in space, but actually sight is probably more 2D than it is 3D. Does anybody agree with me on this? One person, one, <laughs> two, three. Oh, good, good. All right, usually people shout at this point and say, no, Elliot, no, that's not the way it is. Um, <clears throat> so for anybody who doesn't yet agree with me, we, <laughs> right, imagine this is like a window, right? This is a window in the room, and it's either like a projected window or it's a real physical window. And if it's a projected window, it looks like this, probably high resolution. Um, but you, you can see through it. There's an image on the other side. There's color. There's luminance. And if it was a real window with a real background there, you'd see the same thing. You'd get higher dynamic range, you'd get infinite resolution, you'd have this interaction that if you moved your head around, that the scene would change, and you'd have a sensation of, of it being far away, because you'd feel your eyes focusing, you'd have this kind of a, 
parallax effect, but visually, visually it's very similar. The sensation and the vision, um, when you separate them, you can think the vision is a bit about the, the direct aesthetic of what you're looking at, and the, the sensation is something which you can only have when, you, when you're there. So we've got Mario, right? Mario lives in a 2D world, so we can use him as a nice analogy. He, he lives in a 2D world, and he, he's kind of down here, and he, um, he, he looks out from his point of view, and this is what he sees. He can't see through walls the same way we can't see through walls. If he looks in a certain direction to, into infinity, he'll, he'll see blue or something like that. Um, and he, he, his eye exists as one point in this 2D world. So he's looking around, and he, he ends up seeing like this. This is his view. <laughs> he's got a 1D view. He's kind of like looking down like that, and he's got like the bricks above him and the bricks beneath him. And maybe you can tell how far away these different colors are, but this is his 1D view in this 2D world. So back in the 2D world, we're the god. We're the thing that looks out into the 2D world. We exist in a 3D world. But he, he is a, he's, he's looking in 1D. And the same thing's happening to us in, in 2D and 3D. So we look at a work like this by Anish Kapoor. And we might say this is definitely a 3D thing. This is 3D. There's no point in even talking about it in 2D. Um, but what I would say was this is like a, it's a generator of, of 2D views. You can't think about this unless you talk about reflection. And if you talk about reflection, you have to have a point of view which the view is reflected from. Otherwise, there's no reflection there. If you, if you think about it like in a 3D package, then, then you might have the, the mesh of it or something like that. But unless you've got a point of view which you're looking from, you can't see reflection. And as soon as you've got a point of view, you're looking outwards from there, and you're seeing in 2D. Um, and like, one thing I often say to people is if you close your eyes and try and imagine a sphere, like you're going to imagine a shaded circle. Maybe it's got like some different texture or whatever, but you can't imagine really what a sphere looks like. You can't imagine anything in 3D. Like the sight, you're so trained on, on, on what the world looks like, and it looks like in 2D. Maybe you can, you can but you'll never be able to describe it. So we see surfaces. This is our problem. We see line of sight, um, and we can't see through things. We, um, and we th can maybe think then of the world as like this really natural generator of 2D views. That 3D world is one that we can have a great relationship with because we understand how it acts. Um, but aesthetically, we have to worry about 2D much more. And then this, this kind of thing, like two eyes equals 3D or something like this, I just don't think it really adds up. So the final problem, again, going back to what's the problem with making a tree in 3D, is um, most of the time people see it on the internet. We're, we're in a networked culture now. Everybody's sharing the work all the time, and work that um, is, is, is mostly experienced through a remote platform. So most of the people who will ever see our work are going to see it on the internet because it exists indefinitely, um, infinitely shareably. So we have to um, worry about like what looks good in 2D. And if we create something that's truly 3D, it's going to lack truth when we transmit it to that format. So um, we decided to respond to this and uh, make a new installation, make a new iteration out of this. And the idea was to make a combination of something that's 3D and something that's two-dimensional. So before with a tree, we're trying to create these 3D forms that have got mass. We want to create something which also subscribes to what, how, our, how our site works and the way in which we transmit our content. So we created this. And this is called assembly. And it's a, it's a cloud of 5,000 blocks. And each one of them can be thought of as being a 2D screen. And it acts within a 3D volume. So each one of them is, is, a, is a piece of um, sandblasted acrylic. So it's got a diffuse element on the outside to make it a kind of 2D screen, and then you hit it with projection light, and it lights up, so it's kind of like existing in space as well. And we, we do it with this technology. We've got these projectors and cameras that hang out outside it, and this is where the physics comes in. Um, this is what it looks like. So each one of these, uh, each one of these kind of um, uses of the canvas, that we think of it as every time we make a work, we're creating a new canvas, is, is kind of a brush. And the brush is defined by like a, a form macroscopically across the whole thing. 
and a way it works microscopically on each block. So you can see this kind of like an aesthetic behavior of each individual block, which is, is kind of maybe thinking about 2D and then a macroscopic thing, which maybe we're thinking about 3D, about ma visual mass. You see here. So um, functionally, there's, a, there's, there's five projectors around the outside of it, and each one of them's got a little camera that's paired with it. And using, using these pairs of cameras and projectors, we can triangulate things inside it. And then this gives us um, a 3D scan. So we know where all the pixels are in all these blocks in three dimensions. And it allows us to, um, allows us to figure out where the blocks are, where the sides of the blocks are, things like this, which allows us to map the projection onto it. And then what we get is this, um, this kind of um, what I call an aesthetic of error, whereby the system itself has got an ego. The thing that we made is, is no longer the blocks the, the projection, the video of it, whatever. The artwork is the system that we've defined. We said that there's a system which could do this. There's a system which could make this, this type of projection happen. And, and that's a canvas, right? But we're saying that the canvas itself is the artistic object, that the possibilities of the canvas are, are there, but they're implied by the object. They're, it's an artistic paradigm, a way of working. So we expose all of this within the, within the, the output of the system. And we make a lot of open source code. And anybody who's familiar with GitHub might understand what this is, but it's um, basically the, um, everything we make is open source and it's free online and anybody can download our installations and make them if they want it to, but um, mostly it's to teach other people how, how to do things. So thank you.